My people, welcome back to your favorite show, You and I Talk Show with Luis Huacho every week. This week it is full of laughter. If you are anti-laughter, don't even bother tuning in. <laughs> All right, my people, today on You and I, Daryl Lennox. Ah, oh, funny comedian. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to see you in person. I have been watching videos and videos of you. You are just oh, amazing. All right, don't watch those videos. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky, lucky are the people who are going to be uh, seeing you on tour. You're touring all across Canada and the United States, right? Right. The uh, Lennox 2020 tour is based on uh, a television show that I'm working on, but really it's based about I have such opposite of 2020 eyes. Like, so I thought it was kind of tongue-in-cheek to do that, call it that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the main thing is that you've had an eye surgery. Your special is called Blind Ambition. Mm -hmm. So were you born with eye problems or did they develop later on in life? I was born with really bad eyes and then they just continually, I'm, you know, I was like a, always getting punched or punching somebody or running into something. So I helped them get worse, uh, but the doctors saved as much sight as they can. Now I'm just okay with whatever I got left. Oh yeah. my goodness. So I've seen uh, one of your videos where you talk about the doctor telling you the odds that you have of uh, healing or completely, was it between healing or completely losing eyesight? Completely losing eyesight. I was going to lose all the sight if I didn't have the surgery on my right eye here. That's the only eye I can see out of is this one right here. And so this was, I had a bunch of problems in there, some cataracts and some retinal damage. And so if I didn't have the surgery, I was gonna go totally blind. And so I was like, okay, let's do it. Wow. So I did. But you can see me now, right? I can almost see you. I can almost see you. The light is in my eye right here, but I can see you got nice feet. That's, that's a good looking shoe. I see that. <laughs> you, you probably get told that a lot though, about the feet. Well, uh, I never really show them, you know, oh, okay. the winter and everything. Yeah. I'll put it like this. The, before the surgery, I wouldn't see that was a foot at all. Uh, just, oh, wow. I just thought you had oh. a ferret, but that's a shoe. <laughs> It's a shoe. It's a good looking shoe. Thank you, thank yeah. you. So I think we're gonna throw to one of your videos and see a clip, and then we're gonna talk about it. Okay. Because we got stuff to talk about. Sounds like we got some things we need to work yes, out. Yes, we know. Okay. We know. Yeah, that, that's it. Don't let people tell you how you're supposed to feel. Listen, don't tell a man that he's not a good communicator. That's trite. Every dude knows how to communicate. It's just different than you. You probably didn't notice. You probably didn't notice. You, you know that um, men, Never fight with other men over how poorly we communicate with each other. <laughs> there's, there's never a fight between two men to start with, you just ain't clear with me, Earl. We don't talk like that. <laughs> we just like to get to the point and fix the problem. It's just what we do. Me and, me and my friends have a conversation. One guy starts complaining. We will naturally all try to fix his problem. Dude, I hate my job. Friends will go, quit. It's <laughs> good advice. I hadn't thought of it like that, man. <laughs> good looking out. That's effective communicating for us. Not for you. You don't want him to fix your problems right away. Sometimes you need to talk till you get sleepy and worry about a solution later. <laughs> and then you'll get mad at him if he fixes what's wrong with you. This bitch at work, she's so condescending. She takes a tone with me and I hate it. Stop talking to her. <laughs> it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's that simple for everybody. You know how you get mad at us for doing that? We get mad at you for doing this. Interrupting. See, men have a code of conduct when we talk. We go, when I'm done talking, it's your turn to start talking. So when my lips stop moving, that's your cue to jump in. <laughs> Women never heard of these kind of rules. It's physically impossible for her to wait. She has to say what she has to say right now. Everyone in this room, you know. You ever have two girlfriends have a conversation? There's no rules. 
They'll just be talking. She'll be talking. She'll just jump in the conversation. Does she get mad? Nope, she just keeps talking. Does she feel ignored? Nope, she just keeps talking. <laughs> Sometimes she'll just jump in with something that has nothing to do with what she's talking about at all. Does she get mad? Nope, she just keeps talking. I'm really worried about a relationship. We don't talk as much as we used to. I like beats. <laughs> and you do that for an hour. Thanks for talking. No, thank you for talking. And then hug and walk away feeling refreshed. <laughs> and you come home and want him to talk like that. He can't talk like that. His head will damn near blow up if he try to talk like that. If me and one dude are having a conversation and I keep interrupting him with something that has nothing to do with what he's talking about, that's a reason to fight. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. We're going to take a short break and come back and talk about that. <laughs> Show with Luis Huacho. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people please contact info at watcher.com to be a guest on the show. Yes. <laughs> you do everything. <laughs> All right, my people, we're back. There are you so funny. Oh, thank you. So where is this inspiration coming from? Are women really that different in communicating with men? Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I mean, yeah, I'm going to well, try not to interrupt you so I don't prove it. You just did it right, right. there. Too late. <laughs> So you do that. <laughs> Ask the question and answer it before I even get it out. Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I'm was i the only boy, and I was raised by four sisters and a mom, and so I learned all the nuance. I learned how to fight like a girl. Uh, you know, I, I, know how to, I know how to put them up fight, too, but I also know how to, you know, attack a weak <laughs> that you're vulnerable about. And I remember I was, uh, is, uh, this is how old I am, so it was 1976, and the Roots came on. And uh, this little little white guy, I was the only black kid in the school, and he came and he goes, hey, Chicken George, and he just took off running. So I chased him <laughs> down. I, was, I didn't know what to do. I went, he was begging me, so I said, your mother's gonna be fat, and, and your, your breath is unpleasant. And so I, I fought like a girl, right? Like, like I thought that was gonna really hurt his feelings. And then he hit me in the face, and then I beat his ass. But anyway. <laughs> But I do know how to do that, and so I see, I see. But maybe this is your deeper inspiration for becoming a comedian because you're kind of talking. I, well, you know, <clears throat> I always found out that uh, I had a power to uh, communicate. One time, when my mom and I got into a big argument, and, you know, when you're 16, you think your parents are stupid, and you and your friends are the only geniuses in the world. And and I grabbed a, a butcher knife. I said, if I'm such a burden problem to you, why don't you take this knife and kill me? And my mom, this is where I got my funny from. She looked at me, she goes, if I could afford a funeral, I would. <laughs> and, and it was so funny that she laughed and I laughed. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's, I think that's where I get that from. So I've got that ability to say mean stuff, and, and she's just funny. Yeah. So I, I, I do feel like my audience is, uh, without sounding like uh, Hugh Hefner, uh -huh. uh, I think my audience is, is basically, I have more of a female uh, audience than just guys. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I think because, you know, as women, we also gravitate towards men who have a sense of humor. That's a huge thing with women. How huge, though? Well. Ugly, ugly, <laughs> funny dude. A ugly, funny dude. That's not good in bed, but jokes. Well, well, yeah, we well. haven't gotten to that part yet. Oh, okay. that I'm saying, like, okay. in order to even get to that part, it's yeah. a huge plus when you're a little bit funny. Has it helped you? With the girls? Yeah. Uh, no. No? No, the good and bad part. That's what got it done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the best part. But then uh, the funny part, that mm -hmm. comes later. Uh -huh. That comes later. But, but there's no way to verify that. Like, how am I supposed to verify that? What? That I'm good and bad? Yeah. Is this cable access? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I told you. OK. okay. That's how, this, I told you. Mm -hmm. So well, Yeah. But who's going to say that they're not good in bed? A lot of people say that. Really? That's a, that's people a, would actually admit to that. Yes. Really? Here's why. Because this, this is a sweeping generalization, so don't get upset. If you tell a woman uh, that there's something horrible about you, her natural instincts, they go, oh, well, you can't be that bad. Uh -huh. She'll want to find out for herself. Uh-huh. Does that make sense? But if, then if you say you're good, yeah. then there's nothing to find out. What if uh, she believes you, then there's then, nothing to... You know, come on. Okay. Come on. <laughs> 
how many times the shoe salesman go, those shoes would look good on you. You think so? Uh-huh. And you'll buy those then shoes because he said okay. so. Okay. It's okay. Okay. All right. But where is the refund? What if you're not? <laughs> what, if you, well, what is the guarantee that that it's actually going to be real? Is there any refund for a girl if a guy says, you know? <laughs> I know how to say it in Latin, but how do you say it? Uh, uh, how do you say buyer beware in other languages? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> how do you say that? So the risk is on the girl. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But that's what makes you the the, the caregivers and the, the life support system is you take chances that men won't take. Yes, we do. Yes, yeah. we do. See how good at this? I'm spinning so much horse shit. It's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> so you're married now, though? I am. This is my second one. Mm -hmm. This is my second one. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one uh, was not good. Mm -hmm. I knew her for four months, and it lasted for four months. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she wasn't funny? Or that's not a thing that you look for in women? Uh, no, you know what I like better than anything? Uh, a couple of shallow things. A, can you, uh, can you rock a baseball hat? Um, a baseball hat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, can you just rock a baseball hat? I, casual beauty is like way very impressive. Can you just uh -huh. put on a baseball hat and let's go do something. Nice. And, um, you talking to me? Oh. And then, uh, and then, um, can you hold the conversation? Uh huh. It's very important. Mm hmm And, and three, uh, don't be afraid of my family. Like, mm -hmm. it, I hold a lot of stuff in about my family, mm -hmm. and if I share some stuff with my family, I don't want you to freak out and judge me by it. I see. Yeah. Could girls be intimidated by your family because you have so many sisters? It's like, oh my God, he's four sisters. Mm -hmm. Another girl. <laughs> I've, I've, a girl that I really, really thought I was in love with, she was afraid to meet my family because of my sisters. Yeah, yeah. like four of them. Four of them, yeah. 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 But they're nice? They've never interfered with your... No. No, my sisters, uh, we all have a live and let live thing, you know, but they're intimidating, but they don't, like they were going to beat up my ex-wife. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but they don't, you know. You had to plead with them, please don't. No, I was going to let them beat them up too. I hoped they would beat her up. But <laughs> um, she, <laughs> we got like a pack of Dobermans. My sister's like a pack of Dobermans. Uh -huh, but, uh -huh. but we're very protective. My nice. mom used to say, you know, all for one, one for all. So yeah. That's how we are. Wow, yeah. that is so amazing. So your new wife, do you travel with her or how is it going? My new wife is fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she doesn't want to go to a terrible place. She doesn't want to, <laughs> she don't want to go to Milwaukee or to Cash Creek. Or, you know, she don't want to go to Winnipeg. She <laughs> wants to go to fancy places. Yeah. So when I'm in LA, she'll be there for that. Or you yeah. know. So if I'm in Aspen, she wants to go there. So she wants to go to fancy places. Uh -huh. uh, so you've sworn each other for fancy or I stay home? She's always going doing her own thing. She's a musician, so mm -hmm. it's got to be stimulating for her. But oh, wow. yeah, what I do is not stimulating for her. <laughs> All right, we'll take a short break and come back and keep talking. <laughs> you and I talk show with Louise Wachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at watcher.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back with Daryl Lennox. Thank you so much for being here. So you have been in comedy for such a long time. You've long time. worked with great people. You've been on Comics View, BET, mm -hmm. best of BET's Comic View. Yeah. You've worked with Jamie Foxx. Yeah. How, how do you stay in the game and how do you stay so funny? Uh, staying relevant is, uh, is not hard if you really love it. Like mm -hmm. I. I'm an extremist, like I'm an Aquarius, and so we just go, it's all or nothing. And so when I decide the first time I was gonna do it, I'm gonna do nothing else. And so I love that hard, I love comedy that much. And so when I see what Jamie Foxx was doing and Chris Rock was hosting Oscars and Martin Lawrence and those guys, I go, well, I've gotta keep working on it so that I can try to get that too. Yeah. And so I'm very driven that way, hence the blind ambition part. You know? Yes, mm -hmm. blind ambition. Right. Now, when you're facing something so huge, uh, such as you're going to lose your, your eyesight mm -hmm. and you have to stay in there, stay in the game and, and keep going, what is your motivation? You know, as you're going through the surgery, as you're risking losing your eyesight, what was your motivation? 
Uh, the doctor, he was uh, digging in my eye with a needle, and it was hurting. Uh, and he <sighs> said, uh, and he realized I was in pain. And he said, this is just going to hurt, and I'm sorry. <sighs> and then uh, I realized that this guy had to hurt me in order to give me something that I needed to have happen. And I realized I hadn't been working as hard as in my life as that guy has been working on my eye for this hour. So he became like a real tangible, fundamental hero for me. And so I asked myself, hey, man, you know, if this guy gets, if this guy saves your vision, then you got to work as hard as this guy does. Wow. Was that, uh, how many doctors did you have to go through to find the right one? Uh, I had uh, a lot. Uh, nobody in New York wanted to do it. Uh, and then I just trusted, I trusted the, the medical system in Canada. You know, I just thought, you know, there's an underdog thing that I like. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, this is a crazy theory, but I think uh, Canada... Uh, and black people uh, have a similar understanding of what it's like to not be the popular or thought of the highest. And so we have to work twice as hard to get the same level of respect. And so Canadian people work so hard. And so I thought a Canadian guy would work harder for me because nobody in America wanted to do it. Oh, I see. So Canadian people will be like the black people of the North American relationship going on. They have to work so hard to work impress so hard. the Americans. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Does that make sense to you? It makes sense. Yeah. It makes total sense. Sure. That's why. Yeah. yeah. And and how is it when you're working in America versus Canada? And how is it when you're traveling in Canada versus America? Do you find that the audience being different, Canadians and Americans, that you have to adjust your stuff sometimes? A little, little bit. Before I had the surgeries, I had to adjust a lot. Like, I, I don't know, I probably have about six hours of material total. And so I could probably do three or four hours in Canada, about three or something in the U.S. But uh, when I began to talk about my own vulnerabilities, then I could just do that on either side of the border. But before that, like, you have to make Canadians feel like you're not just an American. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And, and you, know, you also have to impress the Canadians. Absolutely. You do. A little bit. You have to impress them. And so, and then America, is, you just have to make them uh, laugh in that moment. They don't care what it is. Just be funny. There's a show, and we pay some money, so you better make me funny. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So. <laughs> and what about, uh, like, going to Africa? You look African to me. Don't we all look African? <laughs> I mean, I mean, have you ever thought about going out, you know? Uh, I got to go to Egypt, uh, and then uh, I've always wanted to do Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, I've always wanted to get go there, and I've turned down South African Comedy Festival quite a few times, uh, just because the flight is just too long, and, and I don't. There's a great com uh, comedian named David Koo out of South Africa, and he kept saying, you have to come. Uh, and eventually I'll do it, but I don't want to go there to work. I just want to go there and experience it. Yes, yes. So maybe you can plan a longer trip, and then you're working a little bit and experiencing a little bit. So can you look at me and tell me what kind of Africa you think I came from? Uh, not where you came from, but where you could be from. Okay, where could I be from? Well, if you went to any part of Africa that you would go to, you would feel at home. They would probably suspect you of being a local, but uh, you know, you could be Nigerian, you uh, could be from Cameroon, uh, you know, you would definitely fit in locally right there. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh. Did you ever look out your roots and, and, and find out? Nope. Uh, I, no, I stopped at, uh, at uh, I knew that somewhere some Scottish people got a hold to somebody in my family. And that's why I have the last name Lennox. And then there's some native Indian in there, but I don't know the African part at all. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, we'll have to do something about that. You can make a phone call for me? I could make a phone call. Okay. Not a phone call, though, because we don't use phones. We, we use the drums, and then we use mental telepathy. You know <laughs> you just talk to me like I'm stupid. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll take that. All right, okay, <laughs> we'll take a short break and come back and finish this. so funny. <laughs> you and I talk show with Louise Wachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at watcher.com to be a guest on the show. Uh, 
All right, my people, thank you for being here. Daryl, thank you for being here. So you used to live in this town in Vancouver. I did. Why did you move away? It's not funny enough for you? What? Um, the, the government helped me move away. Oh, That's what happened. Taxes, eh? No, no. <laughs> well, I've got to be taxes with the brother. Uh, I don't know, because this is Canada, right? No. It was a simpler paperwork violation. But it's always paperwork with Canada, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, it's always paperwork with Canada. Your own paperwork. So I, uh, they told told me I, uh, that I was working here illegally and I didn't have a work permit, but I didn't need one uh, for this particular gig. And I had been living, I had my own little apartment downtown from uh, '95 to 2005, and then uh, I was coming across the border, and they said, you know, we think you're living here illegally and you're working illegally. And so I was just, nope, nope. So I kept telling them no. And then uh, they held me there for about three hours and they said, we're gonna put you in jail. Uh, and I said, okay, I am living here. <laughs> the thought of going to jail made me, I blew the whistle on myself. What? Yeah, they said, but I just realized, I realized later it was a scare tactic. Uh -huh. uh, and so they uh, made me sign a paper admitting that I was living here and that I worked, uh, I was working up here. And they told, spun me away and they said, you can't come back for a full year. So I lost everything in my apartment, you know, <sighs> 10 years of my life, everything. So I was just homeless. This is crazy because you're coming back f to the border and yeah. now you're, you're losing what you were going towards That's and right. you don't even have anything. So I to lost go. the money that I had on the, the books that I had booked and I had, I had one suitcase. With, I had only been on the road for two weeks and so I had to live with two weeks worth of clothing and I had to start my whole life over. And they wouldn't let me come in to get my stuff and everything. Oh my goodness. So, Which border is this? At the, the Peace Arch. Seattle, you were coming from Seattle? I was flew into Seattle and then I caught the shuttle up here. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So did that discourage you or what, did it change your relationship with Canada? Did it force you into a new direction? Vincent and me are real good friends, <laughs> you know? Really good friends and so, I remember I was, I was, so they pulled my bag apart and so I remember, and then they go, okay, you can fold them back up. You know how they be like that and mess up your clothes and oh, go ahead and fold those back up. So I'm trying to fold my clothes and I, I really want to, you know, throw stuff or punch somebody and, and, but I was like, just hold your composure because that's the first thing they want you to do is blow up the spot and then say, told you he was a crazy dude, shoot him like the Green Mile. And so I just folded stuff up and as I, they walked me across to the U.S. side and I thought, I'm gonna be back, and uh, and and they're gonna apologize to me because they were wrong. Yeah. And so they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Success is your best revenge. Best, best. Because you've become so successful, and yeah. maybe they even forced you into a direction it, that you had to take. I hate to say <laughs> that uh, it was probably the best thing that happened to me. Uh huh. Because I always believe, you know, the universe is gonna give you a life lesson anyway. Well, how come it have to be a a stanky one? You know, how come I can't be a good brother since all the time? But maybe I wouldn't have learned if I didn't get the bad lesson. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Wow. So now you're in New York. Now I'm in New York. Do you like it? I love it. I never thought I'd love anything more than Vancouver, but New York is unbelievable. Really? Mm -hmm. You're saying that about New York? Yeah. Wow. You don't like New York? I like New York, okay. but, you know, I mean, there's no ocean like in Vancouver. There's the ocean, but yeah. it's not the same. The mountains, yeah. it's a little bit less green. Yeah. It snows more. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I'm not you like ocean. all that I'm stuff not the now. ocean. I like, uh, okay. I like good ribs. <laughs> uh, I, like, <laughs> I like options for getting a good haircut instead uh -huh. of just Junior oh. on Davey. Uh, <laughs> I, like, uh, I like options, uh -huh. right? I like to go see the Knicks play. I like to go see the Yankees play. Uh -huh. I, you know, I can't keep pretending I like the hockey. <laughs> so there's more options. <laughs> The whole me gets more fulfilled in New York. Yeah. But there's a big part of my soul that gets very much fulfilled in Vancouver. Mm -hmm, Each mm -hmm. part. So do you feel like when you come back to Vancouver, you come into like a small town to relax because New York is so big, it's so hectic. A lot of things are happening. They both offer me a different kind of anonymity in that uh, in New York, nobody pays attention to you. Uh, and so you can just kind of be yourself and nobody judges you. But there's something about Vancouver, like I can walk in Vancouver. Yeah. And I know, I just assume that that car sees me and it's gonna stop. And I just just walk, you know, and I, this is what happens. So I was uh, shooting some of the television show over the summer and then I got, it was nighttime, my eyes are really bad at night. And a, 
and a cab dropped me off. And I said, so you have to put me right in front of that apartment, otherwise I'll be lost. So he yeah. put me on the wrong side of the street. So I got lost, and I'm walking around in Kitsilano. It's not the most best lit part of the town, and I'm stepping in people's flower beds and running <laughs> into stuff. And all I could think was, if this is Florida, this would be dangerous. This I could get one of those, you know, stand your ground dudes. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so get off my property. Yeah, <laughs> and so, so I ran into a tree and I fell down some stairs. So now my leg is bleeding, and so now I'm just bleeding and squinting, and so, <laughs> so I look like I escaped from prison. And so I see this guy on a balcony. Well, he sees me. I smell some weed, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And so, so I look up. I'm so smelling. The guy goes, uh, he's, you okay? Yeah. I said, man, I got real bad eyes and I'm kind of lost. He goes, yeah, I thought you had brain damage. You were drunk or something. <laughs> he said, hold on. So he just came down. He, 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 you want to hit the joint? And he yeah. called the cab and he waited for me to get in the cab. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And it really traumatized me <laughs> that I was like, because I'm telling you, if that was Florida, uh -huh. somebody would have called the police. Yeah. And here I am just bleeding. And they would have thought, is that your blood? Or is that some old white lady's blood? Or, you know, how can you smell like drugs? Like, it could have turned fast, it's bad so fast. Yeah. But it's in Vancouver. Yeah. The dude thought I was brain damaged. <laughs> <laughs> so he, and the, he, he offered you a joy. Yeah, here you go. You want to maybe just help with your, your the brain disease? Yeah. So. <laughs> But that's to me, that's Vancouver. Yeah. It's, it's a very relaxed place where I can stay creative and I feel I feel calm in my guts. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow, Dara, that's so great. I think we're coming to the end of the episode. Uh, I appreciate you thank being you. here. Thank you. Any uh, last words that you want to tell our audience? Uh, anything? Uh, come see the show in New Westminster. Uh, beginning of the tour and that whole Surrey, New Westminster, Burnaby area. I got a special relationship because that's where I started at. So I want you to come out and see it. I hope uh, Louise comes with her pretty feet. Uh, uh, and keep watching this show. Please keep watching this show. And thank you for having me. Ah, thank you, thank you. Are you reaching out to touch Mary? I'm reaching out oh, to okay. give you a high five. Oh, okay, I'm too cool <laughs> for high fives. All right. All right, my people, thank you for being here every week. Thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned for the next episodes. <laughs> <laughs>